let us focus in the third panel and the second day of activities for FIAC Summit 20, Summit 2022. The third panel has as a general theme, uh, energy transition in industry. I will reinforce once more that uh, the audience, the audience, please participate through written questions and let's call, let's call the video for better, for knowing better our lecturers for this third panel. Let's, let's invite our lecturers, Mr. Gerhard Ett, Professor in Hydrogen and Electrochemical Engineering, and Mr. Mrs. Renata Ferrari, Manager of Decarbonization of Yara Brasil. We are going to have two lecturers here with us remotely. Manager of Environment and Sustainability of the Industry of To moderate this panel, I would like to invite the businessman, Mr. Gurgel. We would like to inform our lecturers that each of you will have 15 minutes for your presentations, and I suggest and ask of you that we maintain our t uh, the lectures within the time established. When we are two minutes away from the end of that limit, I will let you know, and I'll let you guys begin your... This energy transition panel has everything is everything to do with what we're talk with the event. I would like to congratulate everyone on the initiative and for choosing my friend Carlos Prado as coordinator and this un untirable giant Prado and Rolin, who also takes part in this team. Monica, you have been a true warrior, and Ciara is being awarded for, your, for the efforts of everyone in the planet. Thanks, each and every one of you. What's been happening is something amazing. Ciara is being an important leader in this process here in Brazil. And the lecturers that are going to award us with their points of view, with clarifications. David Bontempo from CNI, my dear friend here, and Renata Ferrari, welcome Renata. And Fabio Cirillo from Votorantim Cimentos, which is another industry that is going to think deeply on the subject because steel mills and cement manufacturers are two areas that can truly take advantage of green hydrogen and make their activities clean activities. Therefore, let's begin with David Bontempo from CNI. Olá a todos, meu nome é Davi Bontempo, eu sou o gerente executivo de meio ambiente e sustentabilidade da CNI. Queria iniciar já agradecendo né, a participação nesse evento, um evento tão importante quando se fala em competitividade da indústria brasileira. Queria agradecer também ao convite à Federação do, do Estado do Ceará, na pessoa do presidente Ricardo Cavalcante, e mais uma vez aí colocar e apresentar a estratégia de baixo carbono com um foco mais direcionado aí à agenda de transição energética da Confederação Nacional da Indústria, que é um trabalho que a gente vem apresentando tanto a nível doméstico quanto a nível internacional. Então, para começarmos, eu vou aqui compartilhar a apresentação para que a gente possa ter uma visão mais ampla do, do trabalho que a CNI vem fazendo 
aí junto aos mais diversos stakeholders. Bom, é, hoje a CNI ela tem uma agenda bastante estruturada quando se fala de transição para uma economia de baixo carbono. É sempre importante a gente é, começar uma apresentação principalmente mostrando né, a agenda internacional, a agenda que contribuiu bastante para o desenho da nossa estratégia. Né? Então hoje a gente tem todo um início de processo de adesão do Brasil ao CDE, né? uma agenda que é bastante importante né? e um dado que eu sempre cito é que 40% dos instrumentos econômicos contidos na OCDE diz respeito a meio ambiente e sustentabilidade, né? daí a importância da gente ter essa agenda bastante estruturada, né? a ratificação do Acordo Mercosul-União Europeia, onde temos um capítulo inteiro sobre desenvolvimento sustentável, né? e aí trazendo o Acordo de Paris como pilar central, né? e aqui eu já faço uma sequência né? de, de eventos que traz também a importância né, de se trabalhar de forma estruturada e fortalecida a agenda de sustentabilidade. Primeiramente, o Green Deal europeu, onde vem direcionando né, toda a parte do investimento, ações que tratem da mudança climática e também da redução da perda de biodiversidade, trazendo né, a economia circular num, num, num aspecto mais horizontal. A recuperação pós-Covid, né, também direcionando como uma oportunidade de se trazer uma agenda né, de baixo carbono. As deliberações da COP26, onde se tratou muito a regulamentação né, do artigo 6 que fala né, do mercado global de carbono e também, principalmente, de uma agenda mais robusta sobre financiamento. E temos também aqui né, um novo contexto global, né, trazendo a energia como ponto central, quando se fala de composição e também de transição para uma economia de mais baixo carbono. É, aqui a gente tem algumas tendências, algumas tendências bastante conhecidas, né? a CNI tem participado de vários fóruns internacionais, daí a importância da gente mapear né, o que está sendo discutido. É claro que a gente vê né, uma orientação maior quando se fala de energia e também de carbono, né? principalmente quando vários países, várias empresas, várias regiões vem assumindo seus compromissos né, de carbono zero, de, de neutralidade de emissões em 2050, né, exemplo do próprio Brasil que assumiu esse compromisso, né, uma, uma intensidade maior quando se fala de expansão da, de energia eólica, solar, de biomassa, né, novos conceitos, novas tecnologias para compor essa agenda de transição como o próprio hidrogênio, né, que tanto se fala e coloca também uma região do Brasil como o Nordeste, os estados que já estão mais avançados também aí na identificação e no tratamento dessa agenda do hidrogênio, né? enxergam também o carbono como uma nova commodity mundial, né? discussões como a eletrificação e também o fim dos subsídios de fontes fósseis, né? e a entrada também bastante importante do setor financeiro, exemplo de bancos centrais, principalmente conectando com a agenda ESG, né, que vem sendo bastante discutida e que a CNI tem dado também bastante visibilidade junto com as federações, né, e sistemas também de precificação de carbono, a exemplo do mercado regulado, que é o que a CNI vem trabalhando junto com o Congresso Nacional, de forma a implementar um mercado regulado de carbono sob a ótica do cap and trade. Então, tudo isso para tratar né, questões relevantes como uma discussão que vem ganhando corpo também no contexto internacional, o chamado CIDEN, né, que são um ajuste de carbono na fronteira, que vem também demandar cada vez mais né, é, dos países que ainda não fizeram uma transição energética, de países que não trabalharam ainda uma economia de baixo carbono. Então, tudo isso traz também todo esse contexto, toda essa necessidade de se trabalhar essa agenda. Aqui algumas vantagens comparativas do Brasil, né, que colocam né, o país como um dos grandes potenciais, principalmente aí sob o olhar né, de agentes internacionais. Hoje temos aí uma matriz elétrica e energética bastante limpa, né, quando se compara principalmente com a média dos países da OCDE, uma indústria de baixo carbono, hoje o Brasil é o segundo maior produtor de biocombustíveis, é, temos a maior biodiversidade do planeta, cerca de 20%, né, 15% só na Amazônia, um país com uma ampla cobertura florestal, né, aproximadamente 60%, e uma grande disponibilidade hídrica do mundo, cerca de 12% das reservas mundiais, né, e aí nos coloca 
né, nos traz a grande questão. Então, como transformar essas vantagens comparativas em vantagens competitivas e colocar o Brasil aí de vez como um dos grandes players né, quando se fala de competitividade e sustentabilidade no contexto internacional. É, aqui a gente já é, evolui para a nossa estratégia de baixo carbono, é o que a gente vem demonstrando e, dado, e dando publicidade, tanto a nível doméstico quanto a nível internacional. Né? Então, temos aqui quatro pilares, quatro pilares que têm sido né, amplamente debatido e também divulgado junto a vários parceiros. Então, um dos pilares seria né, a, a questão do carbono, né, traduzido no mercado de carbono. Né? Coloquei aqui anteriormente o que a gente vem trabalhando em termos de política pública, a partir né, de um projeto de lei que vem rodando dentro do Congresso Nacional, mas o mais importante é que ele contemple né, é, toda a parte de governança, toda a parte de monitoramento, relato e verificação, né, e acima de tudo, né, que traga também né, a participação do setor industrial na estrutura de governança, quando se fala de mercado né, de carbono. É, temos um outro pilar sobre economia circular, um agente também pioneira aqui dentro da CNI, né, que vem atuando junto às federações, participações nacionais, a parte de uma política nacional que vem sendo construída, né, assuntos que já foram né, bastante debatidos, como a logística reversa, compras públicas, que vem passando por alguns ajustes para que a gente possa escalonar em termos de política pública, né, contribuições também na construção de um arcabouço internacional por meio de uma norma internacional ISO, né, que vem acontecendo aí há alguns anos e que a CNI vem participando de forma direta e bastante intensa, né, de forma a trazer né, todos os entendimentos, todas as posições do setor industrial né, nas considerações que estão sendo feitas dentro dos grupos de trabalho. Né, uma agenda também de conservação florestal, né, como fazer frente à questão e ao combate do desmatamento ilegal, trazendo a bioeconomia como uma alternativa, uma alternativa que o Brasil pode se destacar, ou seja, como gerar renda, riqueza e emprego a partir né, da exploração sustentável dos recursos é, biológicos né, e também trazer alguns aprimoramentos sobre o Código Florestal. E por fim, o último pilar né, que eu gostaria aqui de mencionar, que é a questão da transição energética, que a gente vai explorar um pouco mais no detalhe aqui daqui para frente. Bom, esse pilar, ele traz como ponto central né, agendas bastante importantes, né, agendas que falam sobre é, é, a transição energética, iniciando né, pela eficiência energética, é um assunto bastante debatido, né, é considerado por muitos né, a energia mais barata, de que forma que você pode trabalhar com reflexos né, diretos nos custos das empresas. Então, o que a gente vem é, trabalhando em termos de mobilização é já uma atuação coordenada com o Senai, né, trabalhar também essa agenda junto às micro e pequenas empresas, né, acho que as grandes já trabalham né, em alguns movimentos dentro dessa agenda. É um maior direcionamento dos recursos é, dos programas de eficiência energética para a, a, as indústrias, ou seja, a gente identificou que hoje o, o, o percentual destinado à indústria está aquém do esperado, então a gente pode né, desenvolver formas de fortalecer e de estruturar melhor a participação da indústria quando se fala né, em eficiência energética. Então, para isso, a gente já desenvolveu alguns programas, no passado fizemos o Aliança 1, né, foi um programa direcionado aí para 12 plantas industriais, né, tivemos uma redução média de 5,5% no consumo total de energia, né, cada real investido a gente gerou 3,4 reais né, por ano em economia de energia, um payback bastante curto, de cerca de um mês, né, e uma economia de energia que dá para abastecer aí uma cidade de 60 mil habitantes. Então, devido a todo o sucesso desse primeiro programa, a gente lançou esse ano, né, já estávamos com, com todo o convênio assinado, né, o programa Aliança 2, né, é uma aliança que vai dobrar a quantidade de plantas, é uma parceria da CNI com a Eletrobras e a Brasse, né, com o viés né, e aí um, um, um objetivo mais estruturado, mais é, é, é fortalecido de redução de custos, né, de consumo, de insumo de energético e também 
da quantidade aí de emissões de carbono equivalente nessas 24 plantas industriais. Bom, aqui a gente já começa a trabalhar também né, a expansão dos renováveis dentro do pilar de transição energética. Então, temos ali um trabalho bastante intenso quando se fala da produção de energia a partir de eólica offshore. Sabemos que precisamos tratar todo um arcabouço regulatório que vai desde a parte de outorga até o licenciamento ambiental. Hoje, dentro do IBAMA, temos 54 projetos aguardando esse licenciamento ambiental, responsáveis por cerca de 133 gigawatts de energia, né? mas é uma agenda que a gente é, vem enxergando, é uma redução de custos no, nos próximos cinco anos, né? e também uma quantidade imensa de investimento, cerca de um tri até 2030. Né? Passando para a agenda de biocombustíveis, a ideia aqui é fortalecer o RenovaVI, né, trazer aí mais previsibilidade e menos volatilidade, né, dado que a gente já começa a perceber, né, e é um reflexo né, do sucesso do programa também, a evolução do preço do CBIC, saindo aí de R$ 82 para R$ 202, reais, o que mostra aí essa evolução e, e, e transparência, e também a contabilidade da qualidade né, desses ativos. Né, trazemos também aí a importância de uma agenda tecnológica, uma agenda de captura e armazenamento de, de CO2, é uma agenda que é bastante é, é, é falada no contexto internacional e traz também uma alternativa para aqueles países que trabalham, por exemplo, com hidrogênio, que vão trabalhar também com hidrogênio azul, uma agenda bastante discutida quando se fala de petróleo e gás, é, mas é uma agenda ainda que se encontra cara, cara mas que a CNI enxerga também aí a, essa tendência né, de barateamento e com certeza vai ser uma opção bastante importante quando se fala de transição para a economia de baixo carbono. É, aqui a gente já começa a trazer a agenda do hidrogênio, né, o hidrogênio como um vetor energético, né, tivemos recentemente a, a publicação da política nacional do hidrogênio, é claro que precisa ser feito alguns ajustes, principalmente em termos de integração com várias outras políticas, como a política climática e outras, né, que juntas vão proporcionar essa transição para uma economia de baixo carbono, né, um aperfeiçoamento também em termos de regulação para o mercado doméstico e também né, olhar para o mercado exportador. Né, a gente sabe que hoje né, precisamos evoluir em termos de escoamento né, da geração de eólica offshore, o potencial dessa geração offshore é 3,5 vezes maior que a capacidade instalada que temos hoje em dia. Né? É uma oportunidade também de gerarmos novos modelos de negócio, né? complexos industriais portuários e plantas industriais daqueles setores mais energointensivos, a exemplo do próprio cimento e muitos outros. É uma agenda que é bastante comum entre várias em várias agendas, né? as quais foram citadas aí no início da apresentação, que é a questão do financiamento, né? como, como ter essa participação, esse estímulo né, para se fazer essa transição e principalmente monitorar a evolução do mercado né, e ajudar a superar os desafios né, de dois pontos bastante importantes né, em termos de transporte e também de armazenamento. Né. E aqui já caminhando para o final, né, alguns exemplos de, de, de números, né, de importância dessa agenda do hidrogênio. Né. A gente sabe que hoje o Brasil está entre os países mais competitivos em termos de produção de gadores isso pode ser identificado facilmente aí né, em termos de investimento de países desenvolvidos e apostando né, bastante aí no potencial do Brasil. Né. É, no mundo, a gente já considera aí 990 iniciativas, né, muitas delas aí, né, dois terços europeus. Né, o uso final né, do hidrogênio né, prioritariamente para a parte de mobilidade, 25%, mas também trazendo a importância, a importância da geração elétrica né, com participação de 17%, na agenda 2050, um potencial de reduzir as emissões até 90%. Daí né, a aposta de muitos países né, de trazer o hidrogênio na composição das suas matrizes para que possa fazer uma transição aí, é, é, que atenda aos prazos estabelecidos, aos compromissos firmados né, e também é, é, façam essa segurança energética de uma forma né, é bem estruturada, que é um ponto muito importante, muito falado aí no contexto internacional. Então, por exemplo, no Brasil, né, a gente sabe que tem um potencial de 200 bi de dólares em investimentos até 2040, 
só na região aí é, do Ceará, 14 bi anunciados por três empresas em 12 meses né, no Porto de PC. E aqui alguns dados do, do, do mais internacionais né, no mundo, um potencial de 2,5 tri de mercado, né, uma geração de empregos de, 13, de 30 milhões e também aí a quantidade de gás de efeito estufa ele está chegando aí a 6 gigas né, de tonelada de, 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 de CO2. Então isso mostra também aí o potencial do hidrogênio, né, a importância de se desenvolver todo esse arcabouço né, regulatório e legal, que a gente consiga pavimentar o né, um caminho para que o Brasil seja aí uma das grandes potências em termos de energia. Então eu finalizo aqui a minha apresentação, né, agradeço mais uma vez a oportunidade de estar aqui né, e poder é, dar publicidade às ações da CNI, dar publicidade à estratégia de baixo carbono com foco na transição energética, é uma oportunidade que o Brasil tem e que com certeza a CNI vem trabalhando bastante para que a gente possa aí ser bastante competitivo nessa agenda. Então, muito obrigado a todos, um ótimo evento e fico aí à disposição para eventuais interações né, quando for necessário. Muito obrigado so much. e um bom Have evento para todos. Okay. A CNI tem um papel muito relevante nesse processo. I'd like to pass the floor to our friend Gerhard for his lecture uh, about the decarbonization in the industry. Morning, everyone. This is a wonderful event, really differentiated from the technical, politic, political, social, environmental points of view. From one side, we see that education is one of the main causes and advantages to mitigate problems to advance energetic energy transition. Education plays a major role. And uh, regarding this, together with FIEC and together with Senai, uh, branch of uh, FIEC, an educational branch, and it's impressive uh, to see the number of of graduated students in this new field, this new matter of uh, green hydrogen. Well, um, my presentation is about my work. I am a professor for the chemical engineer laboratory in a new university, and then I, well, I work with hydrogen, I, and with uh, um, combustion cells and batteries. We work with biofuels and my focus is a hydrogen. It's more than a focus. It's more than a... It's, it's almost a religion to me. It's close to this. And this is my department of electrochemical engineering develop, developing stacks, so the, the reform of ethanol, reform of uh, ammonia, and uh, with this, I start technologies and markets, hydrogen markets. Paracelsus in 1520, well, ancient time, by, well, when Brazil has been discovered, the territory, so Paracelsus was producing hydrogen. And uh, in uh, 18th century, we started to produce industrially. And well, uh, lot of, lots of uh, great development. We passed through a, great through a great development process in 600 years. So families and companies and scientists working for that. It's fantastic, but we need to keep educating people. We need to foster knowledge. And according to Bloomberg, Five to fifteen trillion, trillion dollars will reach the market. We also need investments and economy. But hydrogen also brings advantages and a few technical properties that are important to be known. That's where education and technical knowledge comes in. The great advantage is its volumetric density, which is low. It's heating properties. 
Mas no processo de obtenção de, de, de hidrogênio... <risos> so in the process of the hydrogen production, we have lots of sources and producing carbon through um, natural gas, for instance, and some characteristics we need to be attentive to. I cannot only replace hydrogen in different processes. So we need to adapt processes. And uh, uh, we need to be careful in these process adaptation using hydrogen for different uh, for different outcomes. And here, uh, together with Abiquim, the Brazilian Association of Chemists, we've assessed the potential for uh, various applications. So there's that's here we have the GDP for Brazil. So. So, derivates from oil, petrochemical, and uh, coke, and we see that oil makes part, uh, makes a big part of the Brazilian GDP. Brazil is one of the greatest producers of uh, hydrogen to the world. From the, the gas and from the oil explored by Petrobras. Here we have vehicle automotive um, field, uh, automo automotive industry by moved uh, with uh, field uh, with uh, hydrogen and uh, in the steel mill sector. We have lots of companies in this sector working with hydrogen. So that's uh, we have in the arrows pointing out to the six biggest GDPs in Brazil in terms of uh, GDPs produced by industrial sectors. And I can use, theoretically, I can use hydrogen for all those processes mapped. But each process features specificities and then we need to research to adapt that uh, a root syngas uh, syngas is like a lego that uh, children toy we can uh, use the process called fischer tropsch a chemical process to produce uh, diesel, kerosene, and we have the methanol root as well. I can produce dimethyl, um, dimethyl methyl ethylene also. I can have hydrogen um, using in refining plants. And also, I can produce ethanol and diesel. I participated in a project, for instance, I've managed for five years a project to produce uh, green diesel from biomass. So, um, manufacturing electronic components, fuel production, leak. Uh, detectors, the helium gas is uh, almost extinguished, if you allow me to say, and we can use um, and um, producing methanol, space exploration, meteorological balloons, so many applications for the hydrogen, and companies like Linde, they know a lot about it, and they know how important it is to adapt. And some cases, ammonia case, for example, uh, the ammonia industry is a very well-established uh, industry. We have uh, these processes well known since um, the beginning of the 20th century, so it's a robust, solid, uh, technology for ammonia and urea uh, in this fertilizer area that uh, well, the GDP of Brazil has a great influence, suffers a great influence from the ag uh, agriculture production. Fertilizers are very important though. We have a process here occurring from 150 to 250 bar between 400 and 500 uh, Celsius degrees. 
and we have again the materials market because they need materials that are resistant to high temperatures. And here, uh, gasification plants around the world from um, the sugarcane bagasse and uh, RISF and other materials. I can produce hydrogen. If you type uh, gasification.org, you can see it. This is a plant from Parana, Parana the state of Parana, or uh, asphalt residue, so acronym RASF. They produce a thousand tons per day for uh, urea, but RASF, RASF, is a byproduct from oil. I can replace the RASF with uh, green hydrogen, with natural gas, with uh, biomass. But all this adaptation, for all this adaptation, I need a study uh, to adapt the process and its costs. It has a cost. And sometimes it's even more cost effective to create a brand new plant than adapt, than to adapt. We have uh, Yara, Yara here. <laughs> So we see here that 98% of the fertilizers are uh, imported. So we need uh, green hydrogen, uh, we need a hydrogen, a fertilizer, and ammonia. So all competitive, they must be competitive. We are here at FIEC, that's the house of the industries, and we need to foster profit, right? You can't work with zero profit, or profit zero. Well, and here we have a, a process, a food basis, or, food, or a process based on food, um, and um, roughly 10% of the GDP comes from this food industry, food based industry an area that would uh, benefit from high-quality hydrogen. And in the steel milling, we have two areas, so heating for the oven, for the, um, for the, and, uh, and, with the, and the high, um, in the furnaces, and high temperature furnaces, it's one use. And uh, here we have uh, 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 reducing agent as, an, uh, as another uh, chemical usage. And here we have a market of um, from uh, the information from the Steel Milling Association, so a $90 billion market. And here we have a plain glass production using hydrogen, high temperature process special material required, and uh, basically we have four companies in the world working with plain glass. One of them is in Pernambuco, in the state of Pernambuco. So on one hand, we have uh, Ceará offering hydrogen to southeast and to the northeastern region as well. And um, opportunities for partnership, that's why I'm here, to show what uh, FEI uh, our university has been done. So we have these routes 2030, obtaining hydrogen from methanol. This is a huge project, but it's a technology that can serve to other processes. And um, Ceará has a lot of sugarcane um, and sugarcane residues. And we have another project that age 2020, Horizon 2020 for um, fuel production. Now another joint project with three universities, FEI, USP, and IPT, USP and IPT, using methanol, syngas production with Professor Ronaldo, it's like a Lego a toy for uh, so pieces for making up new fuel. And I would like to highlight this route 2030, coordinated by FEI, 
together with the State University of Ceará. And we have here featured Mrs. Mona Lisa, awarded yesterday. And uh, we're fostering knowledge. And FEI is in uh, the biggest technological pole uh, near the surroundings of Sao Paulo. And, uh, and we have lots of uh, former students in good positions in the market. And we have here a project of reformers, some papers I've been publishing talking about uh, lithium batteries and, uh, and machinery, but my heart beats quicker for hydrogen, so no way, so no return pathway. So, and this is uh, here uh, a work uh, in which I participated the biggest uh, cell in South America, so fully produced 25 years ago, the biggest fuel cell, PEM, of the South Hemisphere, produced uh, in, uh, in Brazilian universities with electrocell. And everything can be produced in Ceará, and when we can work with, uh, with uh, already developed components. And we have here good players in the, this room that can provide their own stack based on existing technologies. That's it. Thank you, Gerard. I would like to pass the floor to Mrs. Renata Ferrari. FIEC is organizing. I would like to thank the invitation from Monica. It's a pleasure to meet you, her in person, together with Dr. Jurandir Picanso. We've been participating in some, in some uh, online forums, and it's very nice to have this post-pandemic contact. And uh, I talk on behalf of uh, Yara Brazil bringing this, uh, our experience in this sector that has a considerable impact in the global decarbonization. And uh, I will talk about IARA, our participation in Brazil, what our, about our reduction, emission reduction targets, and I will bring you some cases regarding renewable hydrogen in Brazil and abroad. Yara is a global leader in the production and commercialization of nitrogenated products. We have a global presence. We have 28 plants, production plants, for nitrogenated products around the world. We are present in more than 160 countries, bring, taking, um, taking our, uh, bringing our products or delivering our products in more than 160 countries. We had a uh, net income, an income of 16, roughly 16, 17 billion dollars. And we are very rele relevant in Brazil and we are almost 18,000 employees. And besides fertilizers, we also produce chemical products um, nitrogen-based chemical products for industrial applications. We have uh, a new business unit, a spin-off from Yara that is clean ammonia. Uh, we're working with uh, blue ammonia, renewable ammonia, green ammonia to serve the navigation market. And we have a global carbon alliance that is a marketplace of a carbon market serving Brazil as well. We are here present in um, the uh, whole Brazilian territory, and we have uh, our industrial complex in Cubatão, the municipality of Cubatão. We work with fertilizers, ammonia, and industrial solutions to serve uh, the national markets. And, um, and we have this Rio Grande port partnership, and we have a unit in Sumaré, for the fertilizer, 
uh, foliar fertilizer production. Yara is in Brazil since 1967, so 45 years of existence, and in the last 10 years, it's concentrated. It's, it's concentrated investments in, in uh, roughly 15 billion dollars in the last 10 years. Yeah, we know that agriculture is a great so, uh, source of greenhouse effect gases. Agriculture represents 20% of the global emissions. Almost 50% um, of these emissions. They come from the inadequate soil use, degrade, degraded soil. So Yara is a company that research and innovate a lot, working with uh, big global centers, aiming to implement best practices in terms of soil management, in terms of adequate use of water, in order to recover soils and try to reduce this impact on the soil usage. And when we look at the fertilizing sectors, the fertilizing production represents 5% of these 20%. We have an impact. Uh, and what IARA is doing to reduce to broad uh, their businesses, to develop new business models and by the same time to reduce the impact on our actions regarding climate. Yara seeks a very positive uh, food security and also positive future security for the um, environment and we believe that uh, it's possible in a collaborative society. We've been developing projects to foster renewable energy and green hydrogen. And we are working with green ammonia and green fertilizers in Europe and in Brazil, not only to meet the requirements of the agribusiness sector, um, either in the industrial part, either the agriculture part, but also to meet 40 to 50 percent reduction in terms of uh, carbon emissions by 20, 50, by 20, uh, 30. And by 2050, we need to be carbon free. We need to reduce to zero our emissions. And um, by 2025, we'll try reducing 10 percent in terms of carbon intensity, that is the amount of carbon produced by one ton of nitrogen used. And our focus is to reduce 30 percent the absolute emissions in scope one and scope two. Scope one and scope two emissions reductions in 30 percent. Scope two Scope one is direct emissions, and scope two are indirect emissions. We have a strategy of uh, purchasing renewable energies for all our plants. Brazil will be our market base, together with uh, certifications and uh, pilots and piloting. And our great focus is to reduce direct emissions in our production plants. We are great consumers of natural gas that is our energy source, our main one, and our raw matter today to produce ammonia. So that's our priority. We have a, a roadmap for projects in these 28 plants in the world for emission reductions. And um, it's, uh, we have predicted investments over $300 million to 2030 to implement all those projects. So there's a history of what Yara has been doing in the last few years to reduce emissions, only with the deployment of catalyzers in our plants, catalyzers for nitric acid. So we've produced 45% of our carbon equivalent emissions from 2005 to 2019. And our targets to arrive in these 30 percent by 2030, uh, it passes through this roadmap, this project roadmap, uh, regarding and uh, with respect to retrof retrofit, retrofitting the older plants, deploying catalyzers. 
we keep up this technology. And for the Cubatown units, we did a stoppage, a great stoppage to increase plant efficiency. And uh, we hope that uh, we can have a significant and energy efficiency for the plant. We've been working with electrification, replace, replacing uh, steam boilers for electrical ones and seeking for new production technologies to improve efficiency and, pr and productivity. And here our biggest focus is the renewable ammonia production through different routes. We have projects in Europe um, under development for blue ammonia. We believe that's the proper way for the energy transition and capture and, and storage of carbon in the soil and geological, geological uh, reservoirs and uh, for expensive technologies, but in some ways we have funding for this and subsidies as well. And uh, I will show you some cases about biofuel and the green hydrogen. And in our Cubatown unit, we are working with the biomethane. These are the roots of a um, low carbon ammonia production we are working with. The first route is the natural gas with uh, the carbon storage in the soil and uh, under, underground. And uh, the second route is the methane steam uh, or SRM. And the third uh, route is uh, electrolysis using renewable energy for producing a lower carbon ammonia and um, for uh, navigation fuel with uh, less uh, having green hydrogen for sustainable fuel for navigation and other uses. We have a project, a solar project in Pilbara, Australia, a project that will uh, start um, to operate next year. We have 10 megawatts of electrolyzers. The idea is to produce 3,500 tons of renewable ammonia. And uh, we also have the idea to focus on serving the Australian market and also the Japanese one. So we have a um, cooperation with Jera. Uh, it is one of the great, <laughs> greatest companies in Japan. The idea is to take this hydrogen in the form of ammonia to reduce the emissions of Jera Group. We have another project in Norway, in Posgrum. We'll start with five and expand into 20 megawatts producing renewable ammonia, 20,000 tons with uh, hydroelectrical plants as the energy source. <laughs> and in the second semester of next year, we'll be producing the renewable fertilizers in Brazil and also receiving these uh, from these post groom plant. And we have a project that is total scale to electrify 100% um, the plant, but it's a long-term project. We need to assess the costs that are very challenging. And for Cubatão in Brazil, we've been working with the replacement of the natural gas for the biomethane. We've closed the deal uh, last year with raízes, with a small volume, 20,000 cubic meters of biomethane per day to produce 20 tons of ammonia. It means 3% of our consumption, gas consumption, in the Cubatão complex. And we are also assessing the production process for renewable ammonia through the electrolytical route, also assessing this uh, for uh, to use uh, at Cubatão. Just to give you here um, a simple scheme of for the production of renewable ammonia, we have uh, we have the residues and then entering through the filter, and we have these filter pie 
uh, and this residue entering the vinegar entering and uh, through the future pie, and then we have the gas generated, and then the biomethane injected in our Cubatown plant. And with this gas, we will use this gas will be used to produce ammonia, and then the ammonia to become a fertilizer to go back to raizes, and then closing the cycle. And uh, some cases here we are working with. Yara closed the deal with Landemann, that is a agriculture cooperative in the Northern European and Sweden to sell fertilizers in 2023. So the cooperation with Gera and recently Yara, Yara bought 15 floating containers to supply um, a northern country. And we've invested in some in the construction of a boat, of a vessel, a uh, vessel to totally electrical to for container transportation from our our plant to the Brevik port a 20 kilometers route totally electrified totally juiced with batteries and that's a step uh, another step aiming certification and Brazil will be a great player producing uh, in terms of green hydrogen and Ceará the state of Ceará and the northeastern region will play a major role in this transition. We understand um, that we have a challenge in terms of scalability. We are working only with uh, piloting, even in Europe, where we have subsidies, so it's a great challenge. And uh, I think in Brazil we can re replicate what we've, we've been doing in Europe, partnering up, so customers, clients, and uh, government, and I think it's the ideal business model to escalate this technology is through a collaborative work. And uh, well, hybrid technologies are, are very welcome. In Cubatão, for example, through the methane route, I can have uh, renewable ammonia, uh, and also I can have the hydrogen route. We are always seeking for the best uh, regional uh, option for our better uh, results. I have a video of two minutes, if uh, you allow me to reproduce, to play it. Oh, sorry, sorry, Mrs. Renata, but we just can't. If we, yes, we have another presentation yet. Well, congratulations, Renata. I see Yara arrived. If we, yes, we have another presentation yet. Well, congratulations, Renata. I see Yara arriving in the port complex of Pessin. Uh, uh, we have a project, we have some wagons in Eliseu Martins, and, I, and those wagons will bring, uh, they will take mine and they will take ore to the port of Pessain and they can and they can come back with fertilizers produced here in Pessain, you know, to avoid the, the empty return, the logistical empty return. We'll have now Fabio Cirillo representing Votorantin Cimentos. The role of green hydrogen in the cement decarbonization, consuming a lot of fuel, everything from fossil origin. And uh, so, Fabio, tell us some good news, please. Welcome, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I thank you a lot for this invitation 
for bringing uh, a little bit of what Paul Florentine is doing. My name is Fabio Cirillo. I am a sustainability manager for uh, Votorantin's Votorantin Cementos. It's a pleasure to be with you. I will share my screen to show you some slides. So, who's Votorantin Cementos? I would like to give you an idea of uh, who we are. We operate in Brazil, but in Turkey, Morocco, Canada, Spain, Bolivia, Uruguay, and others. And we have not only cement as a product, but a comprehensive portfolio. So the concrete, the aggregate, so uh, the plaster, and the uh, agriculture inputs. And uh, we also have our uh, our processing plant that is Verdera, another brand of us. And this global presence makes us to be mature in terms of the evolution in these trends and mainly talking about decarbonization and technology. Today in Spain and Canada, the two regions where we operate, so the carbon, so the oil carbon operation has a specific carbon approach and in, in those regions we have uh, uh, the stimuli that uh, to be more competitive and to be more sustainable. So in resuming uh, this conversation, so climate change are a huge challenge for the sector and for the world as a whole. So media is dealing with each day more dealing with this, this theme. The effects are very clear. We feel the effects on global warming. So we've had a very intense crisis, hydrical crisis this year, and then intense rainfall causing damage and harm to people. And in Europe, we are experiencing a heat wave that is killing people. So uh, consequences of climate changes predicted by the scientists, impacting global economies and impacting the environment. So the concrete, the cement sector, as uh, we see uh, that our sector has a great challenge to, in order to change, to fulfill the Paris targets, but the concrete is fundamental to this uh, new uh, zero carbon world. Uh, the concrete is a product that offers great resistance in those uh, extreme events, extreme winds, extreme rainfall. It's a product with a great uh, durability and uh, with thermal, uh, thermal insulation. And so the durability of the product, the effectiveness of its use, so we have a very um, compliant product, or uh, uh, if you allow me to say, and trying to meet this new carbon agenda, but it's a product that will make feasible the necessary infrastructure for the transition, renewable energy and public transportation, and here I see some examples on how uh, media is exploring this theme. So we need to make great efforts to limit this global uh, warming to 1.5 degrees. And we are uh, roughly around 1 Celsius degree. If we do not reduce dramatically the emissions, so the scenario is to reduce half of the emissions by 2030, and to achieve zero carbon in 2050, it's a huge challenge. There's a cost to do this, but the cost will be even bigger if we do not achieve, if we do not accomplish this mission. And uh, that's why we are structuring ourselves uh, to comply and uh, to meet the best practices. 
provided by the scientists to avoid their, their uh, catastrophic predictions. So this is an image illustrating so the struggle that COVID-19 made us face. But you see there's another, there's another pugilist uh, outside the ring that is climate change. And so the Earth struggled with COVID-19, but uh, look, the, look the new uh, opponent, the new enemy outside the ring. Well, it's, uh, it's um, much more dangerous opponent. So um, climate changes are changing the, the climate, uh, the weather. And with the extreme events, for example, when we look at the World Economic Forum, we have a global report, annual report. And climate changes are always in the top risks of the risks uh, assessed, amongst the risks assessed. So it's the main challenge we have as hum humanity. And why this theme is, very, is important to us? Well, this is a big challenge. The cement sector represents 7% of the global emissions on CO2, either by the production scale, and uh, we have a, a great demand for this product, and we have an infrastructure gap in the world, mostly in the countries under development. We need to create uh, facilities and buildings for every facility, and roads, and hospitals, and, and nurseries, and, uh, and uh, housing, etc. And we have a great challenge to decarbonize the sector. We work together in our sector, in other players, in the companies' unions, and globally, we have the Global Association for Concrete and Cement, and we work with, uh, we have some work groups, and we produce these zero carbon roadmap, which are the leverages and which and how these company will evolve to 2050 to deliver an aligned carbon, an aligned car neutral carbon reality and we have our commitments with 2030 agenda besides zero carbon re emissions uh, reduction of the emissions and we have these other SDGs like ethics integrity well-being and, and safe safety diversity environmental footprint circular economy and the value the added value to the communities in the surroundings of our activities. We have 19 uh, uh, targets and within seven goals. And annually in our integrated, integ integral report, we tell, we report on how we are dealing with all these issues and how we are um, thriving as well. And um, well, decarbonization. Uh, we need to deal with our direct emissions. Around 60% of our emissions are based on calcination, so the calcarium burning. So calcarium calcination, and this calcination releases CO2. We have uh, uh, furnaces of uh, the temperature of more than 1,000 Celsius degrees, and uh, our leverages are the replacement of fossil fuels for alternative fuels. We use a series of fuels, uh, solid and uh, agriculture residue, the most diverse ones. We use a lot of residues, gaining a new life with this new energy, energy yield, helping us also to eliminate uh, the emissions. And we have a, a byproduct uh, from this calcination, and we also uh, use the ashes from other, from other uh, industrial processes. We use also slag, so byproducts from residues from other activities 
and we use as a raw matter input trying to improve uh, the uh, final outcome. And in terms of electrical and thermal um, efficiency, it's, uh, these are important drivers to us, and uh, also commercialization. So good part of our ambitions production must be from the usage of hydrogen and, uh, and uh, capture of carbon and other leverages. And 30% uh, of our matrix are based on hydroelectrics, uh, hydroelectrical plants. We are investing in uh, photovoltaic parks, and we need to increase around 30% in, uh, in this renewable production. And we are also keen on using green hydrogen. So the opportunities for the green hydrogen within our chain, considering it as a fuel, uh, today we see the hydrogen as more as an additional fuel when we, for example, when we use a lot of alternative fuel, we acknowledge some oscillations in our oven temperature and it uh, hinders the best efficiency. And some small volume of uh, green hydrogen added to these alternative fuel, we can elevate the levels of uh, good combustion without losing efficiency in the oven. And then we see space for the use of hydrogen to increase in 10%. And the hydrogen as a lever for carbon capturing. It's very clear to us in our sector that around 40% of the emissions reductions it shall be dealt with and uh, capture and carbon sequestration. We have some initiatives around the world under study and uh, piloting pilot projects in general to take, for example, carbon and separate it from the chimneys and uh, store this carbon in oil or wells and underground in general mineralizing this carbon in the underground. And a great uh, promising lever is the use of the green hydrogen. It would make sense only if hydrogen is green. So the hydrogen plus CO2 for hydrocarbonates uh, production, so fuels in general. We have some projects around the world doing this uh, in a very well shape, producing ethanol, for example. And so we are assessing lots of possibilities, and then we've concluded that hydrogen, the green hydrogen, has a major role in the decarbonization of our industry. Well, I think it's worth it to mention the associations, partnerships, alliances that Votorantin Cements feature and interact around the world in a pre-competitive agenda, an agenda that favors decarbonization throughout the whole industry. We have a network for innovation together with the industry to sponsor studies together with the academia and the global compact and all the initiatives that we make part with, obviously, adding a lot of value, either as benchmarking, either as a tool to follow up all the trends in the market of what is expected from us. I close my presentation here, and I invite you with this QR code to access our integral report. And you can see our sustainability commitments I thank you very much for the kind invitation to be here. It's a pleasure. Sure thing, it's a theme that is uh, promising, and we have a lot to advance in terms of decarbonization. And it's been a pleasure to be here to share all our knowledge with you.
Thank you, Fabio. Thank you very much for your... So we have two questions here to our friend uh, Gerard and one to Renata. Let's try to be brief in our uh, answers to try to recover these 30 minutes delay. And uh, the coordination of the event has been effective, control in time. And uh, Professor Gerard, Gerard uh, it's from Portugal, a question from Portugal. A person asking about the demand, for example, European demand for combustion cells. And uh, the people here... Uh, if would you recommend to Ceará to use these potentialities in the universe, local universities, replicating the various examples presented here? And please, when you answer, when you finish your answer, please state your final remarks. It's a big honor to be here, and uh, partnerships are always welcome to our institution, FEI. Uh, as much we collaborate, quicker we will advance. Technology needs to be improved and developed, including in Portugal and in Brazil as well. So Portugal is... Um, uh, fellow country, I would say, but uh, with very different uh, climate and social features. Portugal is a um, key player in the hydrogen, in the hydrogen field. Uh, Monica, I think she's following up. And all the fellows here, they work with Portugal and they know better than me. And Portugal is close to the Brazilian Association of Hydrogen, or for Hydrogen, which uh, I am a founder for, and uh, for which I am a founder. And I would be, it would be nice to exchange with someone about Portugal. Okay, another question here to our future FIEC. Affiliate uh, Renata uh, as a representative of Yara Brazil. Well, uh, in the case of the biomethane, do we have carbon capture as with the fossil methane? And please, final remarks afterwards. Very nice question. We have this project um, within our sugar and ethanol plants, and if the CO2 is captured, in the, in the process, we, have, we need to capture this carbon with the negative footprint. And then we'll have ammonia, a fertilizer with uh, an even bigger footprint in the good sense. And we are trying to improve, enhance this project in terms of volume. And we have, yes, the opportunity to capture CO2 locally, where the biomethane is produced. And talking about Cubatão, so we will have uh, green CO2 from the biomethane, and we'll assess projects. Yes, and um, a part of the CO2, we commercialize it already. We have Linda. We have Linda partnering in up with us, helping us with the production in, for the food uh, industry, but we have an exceeding material that we'll, we will work with. And I would like to thank FIEC for the invitation. Please visit us in the state of Sao Paulo, in all our in, um, facilities of Cubatão and in our head office. Well, thank you very much for uh, Thank you very much, all the participants of this panel. Uh, I would like to congratulate Mr. Carlos Prado, Mr. Jurandir Picanso, Joaquim Rolim, and to every and each one of the collaborators. I've been, I am a former president for this house 
and I've never seen a so rich event like uh, I've seen yesterday and today. It's it's a watershed. It's a watershed for the country, for the planet. So Muito obrigado pela atenção, até logo mais às 14h30, FIEC Summit 2022, uh, uma realização FIEC, da Federação das Indústrias do Estado do Ceará. Presence.